evening. Thank you. Thank, uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, I have to say it is an enormous pleasure and a privilege to uh, introduce tonight's speaker, Professor Rubina Raja, uh, who is delightful. Uh, she is also, I should be more, more formal, I suppose, professor with special responsibilities in the Department of Culture and Society, section for classical archaeology, at Aarhus University in Denmark. Now, I must confess, I don't know quite what to infer from that particular title in the Danish academic system, and uh, that may be my first question, but I would ever that special is exactly the right word in this context. For children, I hold up Professor Raja to you as a model, as a model of uh, wide-ranging, excellent individual research, of high-impact research partnerships, and also of a truly a, a astonishing ability to create or uh, compete to create larger collaborative and innovative research structures. Uh, individual research, 2012 volume, for example, on urban development and regional identity in the Eastern Roman provinces, touching on some of my favorite cities. Uh, as for partnerships, she has impeccable taste with collaborators. She's worked with Jörg Rupke on uh, lived ancient religions, questioning cults and Paulist religion, and several. She's uh, been involved in several other uh, major collaborations around the subject of religion in the ancient world. I'm just hitting the highlights here. Uh, she also has worked with Elizabeth Frude on contextualizing the sacred, and is working with Danish and German colleagues on the International Jerash Northwest Quarter Project, and more on this as we see tonight. Most excitingly, though, uh, she leads, or is about, has officially kicked off her leadership of one of the 12 newly announced centers of excellence established after, I gather, uh, competition in tooth and claw uh, by uh, centers established by the Danish National Research Foundation, and that is Urbnet. You see it up there, the Center for Urban Network Evolutions. Um, this is still very new, We're all, and I'm looking forward to learning more this evening, but it, it is already clearly an ambitious and an aggressive, if in the nicest possible sense, <laughs> project, and it's out to you know, explore comparative urbanisms, uh, reach more broadly in space and time than uh, is our, than our sometimes slightly constipated norm, and she's out to cross-fertilize the humanities and the natural sciences. And best of all, they have a lot of money. <laughs> so, uh, so, not that we're mercenary or anything, but when in doubt, give ear. So, uh, without further ado, I'm looking forward to this very, very much, and I invite Professor Raja to come up and talk to us about redefining the urban picture, Jurassic and Jordan, seen through the lens of high-definition archaeology. I will hand her over to you. Well, um, thank you very much for that um, nice introduction that I hope it doesn't make it more difficult um, to speak. And thank you very much for showing up at this, well, for Danish standards, late um, time of day. Um, so that's wonderful to have such a big audience. Um, I have to say, I, I sort of feel that I've invited myself um, because Nicola Tessa Lewis was at a conference which I organized together with Jörg Rübke in January and found out that I was going to the state around this time of, of year and said, well, then you should come to Brown. We should make Sue invite you to come. <laughs> so um, if you wonder about whether my topic fits, it's sort of uh, an invitation that comes from, well, the, the network of people that I'm working with, which also includes uh, Michael Setlow. So I'm very happy to be here and have been invited. And I'm sort of going to do a presentation of the center idea, but also based case study wise on the work that I've been doing, well, together with my colleagues in, in Gerash for the last, um, uh, well, soon five years. The evolution of urban networks was really a game-changing dynamic in the ancient and medieval world. The innovations, cultural entanglements, and environmental exchanges afforded by urbanism and the networks which urban development catalyzed led to social and material complexity, which make up the core of today's civilization. 
The complex stratigraphies of urban archaeology form the principal record of this process. This evidence, the single most data-rich material archive of anthropogenic change in the last five millennia, remains vastly underexplored. Becoming urban is widely recognized as one of the great turning points of history. Emerging research is now increasingly exploring this process in terms of network dynamics catalyzed by global interaction. Archaeological sequences at urban sites represent a really unique, rich archive of the social and environmental interaction implied by urbanism. The Center for Urban Network Evolutions, ERPNET, aims to explore the rise of urban networks by developing high-definition archaeology to urban stratigraphies, merging archaeological methods and historical interpretation with recently developed scientific analytical tools, which now offer decisively new data. By characterizing context, by sourcing evidence of connectivity, and by dating sequences of urban development with hitherto unseen precision, we aim to, in the center, to assess dynamics with improved precision and thus offer true comparison of convergent developments, possibly on a global scale. And that's, of course, what you put in a 20 million euro application. <laughs> and then you go through the process and you, you hope to be able, well, you not only hope, you go in there with good case studies, and then you hope that the next 10 years will really go very well and that you will have very good people working with you also, because, of course, I don't expect to be able to do this on my own. In refining the comparison of written history, archaeology, and scientific data, our suggested research idea or program will test the balance of historical grand narratives and reconsider the agency of civilization. Urbanism is a key pattern in human societal evolution. It is a catalyst of life ways marked by social complexity and networks of wider, ultimately global inter interdependence. Such networks are increasingly seen as a defining dynamic of urbanism. And this is demonstrated by increasing interest in, <clears throat> in consumption and global history and world archaeology as counterpoints to contemporary globalization. Current research should suggest that urban networks may have been critical in triggering societal and environmental changes rapidly across vast spaces. Crucial and also controversial examples would include, for example, the 4th century BC Hellenistic expansion, the Roman Empire itself, the Just Justinian plague of the 6th century AD, the 8th <coughs> century AD Carolingian Abbasid Renaissance, and even the 3rd century AD Mongol world system. What we in the center aim at is to advance understanding of the historical process of urban evol evolution by developing archaeology's ability to characterize the scale and also the pace of events and processes. A series of recently developed scientific techniques afford unique potential for archaeology to refine the precision of dates, contexts, and also provenance ascribed to excavated material. And these will also be integrated to form a new sort of high-definition archaeology to, study, um, uh, to the study of global and also inter-regional dynamics. The provenance of materials is tra transformed through the application of chemical, isotopic, and also biomolecular <coughs> analysis of organic and inorganic materials. And the char characterization of context is augmented by the application of, for example, soil chemistry, analysis of ecofacts and micromorphology. This is then used to reconstruct high precision chronologies through increasingly sophisticated statistic modeling of radiocarbon and other fast developing methods such as optically stimulated luminescence. And these developments have the potential, and I quote here Baylis, to usher an entirely new kind of history. And we integrate these techniques in a systematic research program for the first time at Aarhus University, working together with the laboratories among um, these, um, Charles Lesher, who was building up a new geoscience lab, which is up and running by this um, summer. By harnessing these rapidly evolving analytical techniques and combining them with site biographies as well and artifact studies, this initiative takes a bottom-up, so an empirically based approach to the study of cultural and economic networks in the past. 
And by multiplying the amounts of data, so combining microscale sampling and multi-parameter analysis on the samples, we hope to improve the quality of our grand picture of comparative archaeological and historical models. We want to work at defining local development and then assess the impact of global dynamics on particular societies, enabling a more qualified assessment and understanding of modes of adaptation and also strategies of survival and expansion. The work of the center might be able to show in a decisively new way how far and also on which time scale local crises and events in fact had percolating or knock on impact on complex societies and their global interaction. The results will enable traditional center periphery models and concepts such as dark ages, wars, conquests to be confronted to a model of changing attractors. And the attractor model is actually one that we are very um, uh, proud of having sort of begun to develop and that's something that I'll, I'll talk a little bit about in a bit. So who and what had really the agency to change history? And to address these challenges, we'll target a limited group of key sites and regions where projects with different thematic, temporal, and also methodological foci will converge to define sequences of urban development. We'll include three regions, Northern, Northern Europe, the Levant, and the East Coast of Africa. We believe that this north-south axis frames a hitherto unheeded societal convergences in dialogue with the much better researched east-west interdependencies with Eurasia. Within these regions, core members of the center also currently have ongoing field projects, and that's of course where we take our point of departure, and they will um, provide us with first-hand empirical material to be tested against a broad range of material from other sites. And these regions will then serve as further anchor points for the center with its capacity to frame also future projects and as benchmark to highlight the potential um, at AU. Traditional archaeological approaches to urban archaeology as materialized in the complex record of deep anthropogenic stratigraphies have to a certain extent been limited by a feature first approach in which evidence is separated and analyzed according to material classes and only reintegrated at a generalized level of interpretation. But by introducing a context-first approach in which a multi-dimensional interpretation of individual context forms the point of departure for integrated site biographies, as we call them, we will stimulate a new approach to urban archaeology. This will combine rigorous archaeological methods with these new and advanced analytical tools to date and also fingerprint artifacts and their context enabling us to assess dynamics with improved precision and thus offer true comparison on co of convergent developments on possibly a global scale. So that is basically what we want to do and we want to do this through the integration, um, as I said, between archaeology and um, natural science and hopefully a new vision of urban development might be guided by the theory of complex ne networks, but as seen by us in the center as a system of cultural attractors through which practices and routines in different societal trajectories converge on homologous patterns. So st sustained through an, the overwhelming, also which is very important I think for, for urban sites, namely the overwhelming communication advantage of cities, which might actually be one of the core um, importance that these sites hold. A historical frame of integration will underpin our broadest aim, which is to assess the long-term significance of um, evolving urban networks. And um, today um, I'm going to try to exemplify some of these high-flying <laughs> words I had in the introduction and I hope to, to sort of uh, will uh, be able to convince you that this sort of approach might in, the, in, the, in a longer perspective be able to actually um, add substantially to the way that we view urban sites, urban development, urbanism in the ancient and medieval um, world. Urban archaeology is 
absolutely extremely diverse. I mean, you see a slide here taken a couple of weeks ago in Jerash and Jordan. Um, monumental cityscapes with a lot of continuity, but continuity that we cannot pin down. I mean, here we have uh, basically urban development going on from the late, at least as far as we can pin down, late Hellenistic period up through the medieval periods, even later than the 12th century and all the way up into the late Mamluk period also. You would have sites um, like Stephanie Wynne Jones working on Zanzibar, um, deserted towns with deep cultural layers also, but where none of the monuments are still overground, all is gone. Then you have um, the site of Ribe, the earliest um, town in Denmark, in Jutland, um, where the vice director, Søren Sindbæk, who's a medieval archeologist um, at the center works. And here you see mm, the uh, first town or part of the fortification of the first town in, in Denmark and you see the sort of absolutely different material that these medieval archaeologists um, are, are working with. So urban archaeology is a lot of different things, buildings, monuments which we um, think we can interpret, the urban landscape themselves, the documents talking to us about these landscapes, so we have the sources and then the cultural layers as the archives which we try to entangle at our, as archaeologists. Defining urbanity, I mean, we have the whole spectrum um, of, of this. It's a broad spectrum, and there's always a meta text. So there's Child, Weber, Finley, who have been and still are driving in forces in the theoretical way that we view, um, that we view uh, cities. So the meta text for what they uh, set up is really evolution. And if you know um, our, the name of the center, we have evolutions <laughs> and not evolution because we are not looking at urban development as a linear thing. And whereas um, I think it's reasonable to say that what with Weber, Child and Finley did, which was very important work and groundbreaking work, but still the, the underlying um, idea is that something starts somewhere and it might also end somewhere and it happens on a straight line more or less. Then there are different approaches and market sites, cities as sites of transaction as the main point and here really the driving force has been capitalism and, and, and urban sites as economic um, factors and nodal points. And in newer theories we are Network theory has become very big and um, cities are viewed as nodal points primarily of, of transport and here the communication uh, factor and the advantage of cities as communication points is really what stands at, at the center. So that was just to, to sort of map out some of the main um, theoretical um, works that have been driving the way that we see urbanism. But that also means that, in principle, cities are always, have always been viewed somehow as a cultural constant. Um, it's approached as a stage of de development and not really as a contingent historical phenomenon. It's also used as an ideal model and therefore used also to benchmark change. I mean, I, my book from 2012, I mean, I would have written that differently now. I mean, it's called urban <laughs> development and it also in some ways views these things in a very descriptive and, and, and sort of evolutionary uh, way and perhaps a little bit too linear than I would have, have, have written it now. Phenomenon like proto, para, pre is employed in a lot of work. Uh, we need to reconsider whether this is actually a very fruitful way and we also work very much with predictable, predictable progress, so expectations of urban sites becoming gradually more and more complex in the way that they work. Um, all postulated primitivism, that earlier phenomena are assessed as not being as good or perfect versions of what happens later. Again, coming back to the very linear way of viewing urban development. I mean, just take what Max Weber says uh, um, here, an urban community in the full meaning of the word appears as a general phenomenon only in the occident. The cities of Asia were not urban communities at all. I think we can all say today that's not how we, we view urbanism in other parts of the, 
uh, um, of the world. Um, one thing um, uh, my application to the Danish National Research Foundation was criticized for was that I didn't take one theoretical point of departure and where was Weber and Child in all of this. But I think it's fair enough to say, I mean, we all know it, we all work with it, but taking our point of departure in that today is, is not necessary because archaeology, just archaeology has shown that, that we need to move beyond and be much more detailed in what we say about urbanism. I, I put another um, uh, universal criteria for urbanism up there, the Bündel criterium. So a uh, place, Biddle says, needs to fulfill not less than three or four of these criteria to merit serious consideration as a town. And there you just go to point 11 and you think, OK, complex religious organization now, having worked <laughs> so much together with your Rupke also in the Lived Ancient Religion uh, project, you need to sort of <laughs> reconsider, well, what does that mean? Again, back to the evolutionary view or linear view of it, well, that then uh, really takes as a given that we have uncomplex religious organization as well. So, I mean, is there any justification in this sort of determining urbanism? Well, but of course it's easy enough, uh, the conceit of hindsight and, and also um, sort of uh, will always working with uh, the primitive and the precursor as what came before uh, the good or the right sort of um, urban vision. Um, here, take um, one citation from Hodges' Towns and Trade in the Age of Charlemagne. It's not far-fetched to regard them and these cities as technical solutions to urbanism, or places, not even cities, often criticized as places to live. Fundamentally, these were places lacking monuments and unfitting to breeding a sense of either the sacred or history or memory. There you have it, I mean, for uh, medieval uh, medieval towns. Or here, the market area was probably only used seasonally. Eventually permanent buildings were erected. In the first half of the 9th century, Ribe got a shallow perimeter ditch. The ditch indicates that Ribe had now lived its status <laughs> as proto-urban. I mean, it's of course easy enough to criticize what people have written before us. But I mean, it really also, I mean, these citations from wonderful scholars are really very good examples of how easy it is to write urban history as well. And before urban comes proto. But what do we do? I mean, that's sort of the problem that I now have. I mean, how do we then uh, frame things differently? Um, this is actually an example that my vice director really loves. Um, it's a very um, weird animal uh, that has been um, dismissed once as a very primitive shrimp living deep um, in the sea, but which in principle has turned out over millennia to develop into a highly and uniquely adapted creature that can actually survive in this place. So it, it, it doesn't have a lot of limbs, but it has two huge eyes, which are light sensitive, so it can sort of find its way. So, I mean, that's also evolution for you uh, somehow. And that made us come up with the picture of the anomaly Kivitas, <laughs> which sort of takes us out of the whole primitive or proto discussion. Uh, because it allows us to look at these sites as very uniquely adapted to their local, regional, or global situation. It doesn't solve the problem, but this is something that we are currently playing um, around with. So, because the expectation of a primitive ancestor really impedes the recognition of an, an unknown reality, and a reality that might never be known to us, but which we sort of need to search for, and it also aligns history towards the presence, again, on this very linear scale. So what we really want to think about in the center also is whether it's possible to give an unambiguous definition of urbanism without creating an ahistorical self-fulfilling concept. Difficult, definitely. Or whether it's possible to give a historical and more open definition of urbanism without creating an ambiguous concept. And that is why we deliberately also are looking beyond, I mean, I'm a classical archaeologist, but we decided to look beyond the Mediterranean also and go to East Africa, where 
where there's a lot of interesting urban archaeology going on uh, for the time being, and therefore also including Northern Europe, where a lot of, of very front-runner medieval archaeology is being done, so that we don't close ourselves around our Mediterranean, which is wonderful and nice, but which needs to be forced to look at what's going on in, in other regions. That is why um, we came up with the attractor idea also, because that might actually give us a way of um, looking at complex and changing cultural attractors through which practices and routines tend to converge. So I think practices and routines are really some of the things that we are searching for here, and, and the change in these, and if we can sort of pin them down in the urban picture, we might be able to get a little bit further. Um, this is not a complete model or anything, but it's just some of these um, uh, features which might uh, work as attractors and which might shift over time. So, well, of course, marketplaces is there, storage facilities, but also hierarchies in different ways, special rules and activities, ways of organizing society, also the co-presence of various groups at various times in uh, the society, and of course, um, networks in themselves. Resilience is also not uninteresting. How do societies respond to crisis, and how is that actually? How might that also be reflected in in the archaeology? So, we want to look at urbanity as a pattern of networks and practices, not just as a pattern of settlement or social hierarchies. And this might actually be part of the anatomy of what we, um, until now, term the animal civitas, which might actually turn out to be what we can term any urban site. So um, this is uh, just a slide sort of pinning out the ways that we would like to do that. Um, and I think I won't go into detail here, but I should move on to um, the case study, which is Jerash in northern Jordan, ancient Gaza, um, where um, I'm doing my fieldwork um, in the Danish-German Northwest Quarter project, uh, which is a joint project between Aarhus University and Ruhr Universität Bochum, and the co-director of the project is um, Achim Lichtenberger. I have pinned down uh, four case studies that I'm going to um, uh, tell you about, and they are put up there, namely urban infrastructure and gardening, water management, uh, termination deposits, that's a very short case study, and then um, domestic complexes, and show you what we've tried to do in these situations, which always turn out to be uh, quite surprising when we, when we dig them, and see whether we can fit that into sort of some of the things we have been working with in, in the center. Um, here you have um, the city plan of um, Jerash and a satellite photo. You have our survey plan down in the left corner. And then you also have the only profile drawing of the site, which is from Schumacher's 1902 publication in the ZDP file, um, which really shows you something about the topography of this place. So we work in the northwest quarter, and it's framed in, in black up here. It's an almost five hectare large area behind the Artemisian. It also happens to be the highest area within the walled city. Um, and that was one of the reasons that we wanted to work there. Um, we wanted to uh, sort of go outside of the main street, because you see what happens when you do archaeology in the main part of the city. You find the main street. You also find a bit of the side streets. And you find the theaters. You find the, the churches. You find the temples. You find all that is there and should be there in a Roman city. And then you don't really go beyond that, um, because you don't want to spoil the nice Roman architecture. And that's, of course, also clear. Um, you also see um, that, that there's not much mapped on the uh, eastern part of the town, and that's because a modern town, as you also see partly on the satellite photo, um, is placed on, above that, and that, of course, remains sort of a, a mystery what, what um, uh, was going on on that side. But that's sort of the challenge that we have to work with. Then you also see that on this newer city plan, of course, there's not much mapped apart from the main street and the monument. So, Anything we are doing in the Northwest Quarter is, is basically uh, mapping uh, a new part of the city. And you see, just from our survey in 2011, 
I mean, from a three-week survey, uh, we went from blank, well, apart from the famous synagogue church, which is placed in, in, in that area also, we went from blank to a densely settled area. And the challenge is, of course, how to date these various things, and that's what I'm going to talk a bit about. But you might also know that, well, Jerish is full of these large monuments, um, so we have um, substantial urban archaeology um, going on here, mainly on um, the main street where it's been focused. So this is how the Northwest Quarter looks, and people thought we were crazy when we um, applied to work up there, because there is basically rubble fields. But as you see from the satellite photo, you can also see some, some structures. And um, we had a geophysical um, survey done, and it's also very clear that some structures on the surface were, f were reflected in that, but you also see here structures that are uh, not visible on um, surface at all, like a, a, sh a lot of rooms running here. You see basically a street network also, but that we can partly see on the surface as well. But it sort of confirms our survey picture, namely that this was densely um, settled um, area. Um, one of the challenges working in this area is really that in the early modern period, it was also used for agriculture by the Chekhetians. And this is an aerial photo from the early 20th century, uh, which really shows you the fields behind the sanctuary of Artemis, or the temple of Artemis, which you see prominently in the, in the photo. And this would be the whole Northwest Quarter. So a lot of earth has also been moved around and, and, and used later for agriculture. But as you see on the survey plan, we really have a very nice um, uh, settled hill, which is terraced and which has streets running, uh, running uh, here um, uh, east-west uh, on the various terraces and small lanes connecting the different terraces also. So it seems to be um, an area that is um, con where the various um, habitation terraces are connected uh, to each other. One major challenge uh, working in Jerash, and I, I think that goes for the whole site, is the amount of fines. Um, here you see the, the whole spectrum from nice Hellenistic stamped black glazed pottery down into the medieval periods. But what you see in the background is what there's most of, and that is the locally produced pottery for which no typology exists. Uh, well, because it basically stayed more or less the same for, for hundreds and hundreds of years. And we have around 300,000 objects every season which we have to deal with and which we finish before we go home. Um, but that is, of course, one of the major challenges working here, especially that we cannot date by pottery. So what do we do? And apart from that, they also seem to have used pottery to fill anything up with when they built something new. So, I mean, this year we had an underground complex on the top of the hill, um, at, at a four meters going, going down a stair, four meter, and it was full of pottery. I mean, we, we, we had to sort of not extend that trench because our head of registration was crying. And so, so you see, we were talking earlier about redepositioning of, of material, um, Sue and Andy and I. So this is, you know, one way. I mean, where, where did these amounts come from and why did they go into these places? Some of it is not even worn, you know, some of it is, is quite new. Another challenge is modern um, destruction. I was up there, well, as I said, a couple of weeks ago, 800 meters of the possibly best preserved city wall in the Roman world is, has been bulldozed. Um, just because uh, a new road had to be built where the tourist buses can go on, so the city wall has had to go. And I mean, it's pretty horrible. We actually reported it to UNESCO. Um, I mean, there's nothing to do about it now because it's gone. Um, but this is exactly on the other side of the fence in the area where we work and is, of course, going to be um, a huge uh, uh, detriment to, to some of the work that we were planning to do on the, on the city wall. And I was hoping, had they just told us, we could have sent somebody to do the geochemistry on, this, on the foundations of the city wall, which we have researchers not speaking to each other because somebody wants it to be early Roman and somebody wants it to be early Islamic, and they're not talking to each other. Mm -hmm. We might have been able to solve this if we had just gotten at these nice foundation layers, which are now completely bulldozed away. So challenge. Well, back to the topography and geology here, the, the northwest quarter is, well, as everything in this city, basically um, uh, um, 
situated on bedrock, limestone bedrock, which is also a challenge, I mean, also for the geophysical survey and georadar didn't work at all because there's limestone all over and too much limestone in the soil to do anything with that. So, and, but what we experience everywhere we work is really quarry traces. So the very first phase of use here was as a quarry. The whole area, I mean, we've not excavated all five hectares and we're not going to do that because one of our aims is to excavate as little as possible and get the maximal information out of it. But in the trench we open and we excavate to bedrock without removing structures, um, end up having quarry traces. So it seems as if this area was producing um, stone material for probably some of the larger earlier Roman monuments um, in the city also. Urban infrastructure and, and gardening, I mean, this sub-project started because we were interested in how the Northwest Quarter was, com was, was uh, linked into the rest of the city. And um, as you see on, on, on this map, we have this nice colonnaded side street here, which this is then our plan, but which on most uh, plans of Gerash is just projected completely out to this um, collapsed city gate. So there is a city gate and there is a colonnaded part of the side street, but it seems, I mean, we know that from the wadi up to the northwest quarter, the, ter uh, the, the hill slopes more than 60 meters, so it's really uh, quite a steep topography we are working with, and we were wondering whether one could really span this with a side street and what sort of solution would you look for there. So we did test trenches there, and perhaps not surprisingly, but never really looked at, um, or never looked at, was that it turned out that there was no street. I mean, literally no sign, and we have now dug three test trenches, and we have re-excavated the British uh, trench from, the 19, from 1982, whether they, where they also didn't come to a conclusion. Um, this is just to show you the line of the street going down to the Tetrapolon, and, and this is taken from from the city wall. When we laid out the trench, though, on this projection, I mean, this is just one of them, what very interestingly came up was terracing and a lot of organic material in very, very dense layers, which really indicate, and we're going to have geoscientists to come down and work on that this year, that this area might have been, or was used for urban gardening of some sort. And, and we are currently having all that information processed, so there's a variety of organic material pots, and peas, and olives, and, um, and different other pollen, which we are also having done now. And if you look at the um, survey plan here, you also see that basically there is not, I mean, we have some large uh, underground structures which also came up in, in our survey, but they're not included here yet, um, here, but this whole area seems to be um, empty. And it also completely, the work we've done here, changed the, the way we need to view the topography because basically the, uh, the, um, the hill ends very um, dramatically and the uh, terrain seems to have dropped with more than eight meters actually in antiquity. So that really also changes the picture. So you wanted the city wall, you wanted the nice part of the colonnaded side street, but then you stopped it and you had a little bit of urban wilderness or probably cultivated wilderness some, somehow. So, and, and there is a lot of um, garden archeology span going on. This, based on what we've done until now, it doesn't look structured in that way but it definitely looks as if it was used for agriculture, which I think is um, an interesting thing. Um, we know that in cities, vast spaces might have been left empty, but we want to know what were they used for, and I really think that this self-sustainable um, issue of cities with, with actually growing your own crops on a much larger scale than we've actually been um, able to, to see until now might be one of the ways that some of these areas were, were used. Water management, of course, is also crucial in, in, in these uh, cities which were really dependent. I mean, Jerash now had the Krusahuas running through it, but as you might also have seen on the, on the slide, uh, this is all um, uh, not as big a river as we probably imagined, and that's another Thing we are going to do more work on, but uh, uh, an area like the Northwest Quarter would not have been fed 
by um, any of the uh, sources feeding the river, but sources coming from the west. And we have also found extensive um, uh, evidence for, for water pressure pipes actually um, running in through the city wall and across the hill, most likely over to this large cistern, which is the largest cistern in the city at all. It's more than 40 meters long and 20 meters broad. And it's always been said that it is probably of Islamic age undertone because it's quite ugly. Um, I mean, it's, 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 well, it's just not properly done. You know, it's not completely straight and it's not completely. So this, these are the sorts of argument, arguments which will actually be put in writing also. And um, it is cut directly into the bedrock on the sloping terrain towards the, towards the um, south. And here you see, um, well, basically a plan and the location of it. And you see a test trench that we put out across it to sort of um, uh, relatively uh, do the chronology of the cistern. You also see here that at some point the cistern collapsed and it turned out that there was a natural cave underneath. So that was used as a cistern in a later phase and you even see the wellhead here that has been blocked at some point. What was fairly surprising to us because we thought we could dig this test trench in two weeks or something like that um, was that it uh, turns out that at some point the whole cistern was converted into a little village. So it's full of structures. So production things and houses and all these sorts of things. So that sort of made the situation even more interesting. What we could make out was actually that there was six relative faces. The problem was just we, didn't, we couldn't date it because um, there was nothing datable. There was a lot of Jerash bowls, a lot of ceramics um, locally produced, but there was um, nothing that in our traditional archaeological way of seeing things would allow us to really do anything else than a relative chronology. Um, so what we then did was to hook up with um, Orbo Academy in Finland, who are really a world leading in dating hydraulic mortar. And since we could relatively date all these um, phases of the different coatings of the mortar and hold them up against regular C14 dating, um, we could actually come up with a pattern. We got a lot of funding, I have to say, from the Carlsberg Foundation to do that because you have to do, run a large um, sample test. We did 40 samples of these, and each, each sample cost 1,000 euros. And then you need to have the report done afterwards. And I have to say, if you can't do that many samples, don't do this sort of hydraulic mortar testing because there will be a lot of it that's contaminated. So you need to test the different batches against each other. And it only makes sense if you can run a big test sample. But what we could prove with, as it always is with C14, with 98.7% probability, which is a pretty high probability, is that this, the first phase of this cistern was not early Islamic, but was second century AD which is really interesting. Of course, it fits perfectly into the picture of this being the major urban expansion period for, for, for Jerash as we see it on the main street. It has just always been said, no, up there on the hill, there was nothing going on because you know it's too far away from the main street. Now, now we can prove that that was not the case. And we just published this in Journal of Archaeological um, Science. Mm -hmm. So if you're interested in reading about 40 mortar samples, you can, <laughs> you can read it there. And it was very well received as a methodological study on how to, well, how to do things if you have a lot of mortar and you don't have anything else. But as you can also see, we could also make out the different repair phases, the collapse phases. And then we have a major um, um, end of habitation also in the former cistern and a period where it was simply backfilled. And that was, you, you might have thought, if we wouldn't have been able to make this out, you would have thought that this would have been the big earthquake of the middle 8th, 8th century, so the, four, um, the, the 749 earthquake. But we can actually show that the habitation ended at, at least 100 years earlier than that. We have no idea why. There doesn't seem to be a destruction phase. It just seems to have been filled in, and a street seems to have been put on top of it, running along its short side and, and long side. And we are currently doing some work on that. But just to say, again, this is one of these grand narratives. Well, with the big earthquake, everything came to an end, and that was closed down. But now, through this study, we can say, well, that's at least not what happened 
here in this area, and that might have implications for 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 the whole for the area as such and and, and the urban development in this area. On the very top of the hill in Trench A, we had a very interesting situation. We actually dug here because of the geo radar, and um, it just turned out to be partly bedrock and partly a building that extended in the eastern direction. We couldn't. We didn't have time to excavate more. But what we found were pots put down in stone, um, in, 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 uh, well, uh, surrounded by stone, so deliberately put down. And um, a lot of people were screaming uh, cremations inside the city wall and whatever, and dates and whatever. But we had, uh, there was a lot of ashes in these, but there were also other things, and there were no human bone fragments. And that's actually one other very interesting thing. We have done all our bones. And we have more than 5,000 from, from just from our uh, now nine trenches. Um, and we do not have one single human bone, not one single. And a hypothesis that's been put forward, especially by the French, who have been working in Jerish for the last 40 years, is that this area was never inhabited in the Roman period because it was a necropolis. And I think we can, with a certain degree uh, of, of security, say this did never function as a necropolis, because we would have found at least one human bone. And we've also surveyed the caves there. There's nothing that, that, that seems to have been necropolis. So again, that changes our view. And the interesting thing is, when we had the fill from these pots, also C14 dated, it turned out that they were from the third century, the early third century AD. So this building was closed off in the early 3rd century AD, which means, of course, that it must have been earlier. We don't know exactly from when, but that we had extensive building activity also going on in this area at a much earlier point in time than usually thought. As you th see on this um, profile of, of the trench, this was the, the evidence that these pots were situated in and then um, rapidly filled in with this large uh, intentional layer of rubble stones, which is more than a a meter thick to sort of seal off the whole thing. And I'm not going to go into whether this is ritual or religious or whatever, because in principle it doesn't matter, it just shows building activity had been earlier prior to, 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 to this um, uh, period. Yeah. Um, my, my last case study, and um, I know that I'm now running short of time, if um, people should ask questions, but I'll go quickly through this, is the work that we did last year on what we call the East Terrace, so facing the Artemisium. And as you see on the survey plan, there's not very much. And that is, as you also see in the photo, because this is a truly earthquake um, destroyed area. So there's basically slim to none structures really visible because they're all covered by complexes that have been destroyed. And it must have been by an earthquake because it's so somehow regular. And I'll show you why this has been confirmed now. Um, it also happens to be prime location. If I was a real estate agent, this is where I would have bought plots and put up nice uh, late antique early Islamic houses. You see the, the view. And if you had, we know that we had all the water out there also. So everything is sort of in place. It turned out that we were excavating um, directly down into an earthquake destroyed house. This is how uh, part of a house. Um, and as you also see, this has the very um, generic uh, sort of plan that, that, that early Islamic houses in the region and the ones excavated by Gabrikovsky in Jerash also has with a front room leading down to a back room. Of course, we only have part of the complex, so we can't say anything about how um, it looked completely. But what was very interesting was that the first floor, of course, <laughs> had collapsed down on the ground floor. Um, there was basically the whole range of first floor objects um, on top of what turned out to be a huge kitchen complex with different hearths. And we could date these very nicely also through C14 dates, and they were smack in the middle of the 8th century AD. And then we were lucky enough to find the second of its kind, namely a nice um, hoard of Arab, Byzantine, and Byzantine coins, um, which we are currently publishing in Numismatic Chronicle. And it's a, a wonderful find. I mean, we could even, we even had the textile imprints of the purse that these were lying in. And it really tells us something about, well, 
um, might tell us something about coin cir circulation, or it might just tell us that these people kept these coins that were out of circulation, because it is we actually uh, in 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 the collapse we also found some. Uh, post-reformed coins, which would indicate that these might have fallen out and been simply kept for, for the value of the metal. So, but that's a point that um, numismatists discuss. I show you here the earliest coin and coin from the reign of Anastasius, and then the latest um, from the reign of Abdul Malik, which is either minted in Beisan, Bethshan, or in Jerash itself. So it only contained pre-reformed coins and Byzantine Points also, and I show you also this wonderful example from Tiberias of an Arab Byzantine coin with the three here, not uh, bishops, but caliphs with the crosses on the head and the complete continuity in the, in the taking over of the uh, Byzantine um, uh, imagery in the early Islamic uh, pre-reform period, and even with the, the Arabic uh, legend Tiberias on. On top of that, we had a um, wonderful, wonderful range of textile production tools. And you might not be able to see this, but this is a flex heckle. I had to learn that myself. So here you have a modern reconstruction of that. You have a huge spoon, probably for using, for dyeing the fibers. This is a sheep scissor. Um, so all these absolutely large objects for textile production, which you would probably take with you home after you finished. Another very interesting thing is that Jerash already from the 3rd century AD was very well known for its linen production. In the North Theater, um, you, you might know of these fule inscriptions of the stif different tribe, the tribes or, or whatever, so the Hadrianic tribe, the Trajanic tribe. But the only professional association that we have attested in these groups are the linen workers in the front row of the theater. And this seems to sort of <laughs> continue um, up through time and also be the case in the late Byzantine and early um, Arab um, Islamic period that, that linen production, textile production was one of the big things. And basically, we had the whole set because we had the wooden casket with all the metal implements and, and a nice, nice crystal spindle world there. Also Byzantine, Byzantine weights also, but probably also scrap metal sort of kept. So it's this transitional period where you sort of still use some of the things and you keep the rest because they carry a value in the metal in itself. And we had over um, 80 um, of, of these objects which sort of make up a very nice production kit. Um, and we are currently also working on, on that. Um, the last um, but not least um, interesting example of cultural adaptation is this little metal roll um, which we found. And uh, working in this area, and especially, of course, also in the area of the synagogue church, we were, of course, all thinking, oh, here we have one of these wonderful Semitic amulets. Um, magical amulets in the Greco-Roman tradition and this is just an example I show you here because as you also see this was extremely thin we had it conserved and everything but we could not unroll it because it was simply too fragile so we had it 3d scanned and we had it sent to a software firm that works with digital unfolding and we actually have now um, gotten so far that we've begun to well we have now we trained an early um, Arabic epigraphist because it actually turns out that this is not um, Hebrew or Aramaic, it's not Greek or Latin, but it is a very early Islamic um, text that we are currently now having unfolded, but which even more interestingly ends with two lines of Greek that seems to be a Greek translation of a Quranic verse. And if that turns out to be to hold up, this is uh, the only until now found example of, um, of this sort of thing that stands in a directly, of course, Greco-Roman Semitic tradition and is smack in the early Islamic period. Um, so, well, you need a little bit of luck and then you need to like uh, spend a lot of time in finding these people and you need to spend a lot of time bringing them together, you know, and, and training, um, having the, the epigrapher trained in using the software and things like that. But it just goes to show that if we, put the, the effort into this, then it, 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 it 
it does pay off. And, and there have already been, and I'm not lying when I say, but 15 people who have now contacted us and asked whether he couldn't do that for them afterwards, because they also have a scroll line <laughs> that they didn't have on road. And I think this is you know, one, of the, one of the objects groups that one might really get a lot of surprises out of. And this is just the, this is the software guy who did this nice image for me <laughs> and sent it to me just to show what we are expecting. So he can calculate, of course, how much scroll there's left and what was unfolded three weeks ago was only this little piece. So, and, and I don't know how they do it, but it takes a lot of time. <laughs> so, um, so, I mean, our hope is, of course, that these contextualized situations will sort of feed into the typology that we can do of all our 300,000 fragments of all this ceramic. Yeah, I've just put on, you know, a, a couple of examples, and it's difficult to tell the difference. There are some chronological markers, but there's also a lot that takes place over a long period of time. And if we can, from these very contextualized situations with our, ex with our ceramics, extrapolate um, and then um, more generically apply to all our other material, I think we might just get on with the typological development of our otherwise quite generic. Um, uh, material. So basically, um, from small trenches, uh, well, okay, this was not so small, but um, from small areas, we might actually be able to get on with some of the very big questions about continuity and change, or about how to view urbanism, or how to do urban archaeology outside of the main street um, and mainstream to feed into some of the larger questions about what went on in these regions over a longer period of time. And of course, I'm not doing this alone, and I'm also not doing it without funding. And I should not forget to thank the team and the very hard work that they do also. And last but not least, all our funding bodies who, who make this, who make this um, possible. And I will leave our mission statement up here and would be happy to take questions. Thank you. Thank you. Part of me was uh, listening and thinking, you know, so many uh, parallels with uh, Brown's work at Petra, but you lost me at the Horde and then definitely <laughs> lost me at the Amulet, and we don't even have mortar on our rock cut cisterns. So, questions about the center, about Jarash, uh, the hottest place in hell for the people who bulldoze the city wall. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, questions. It's, I mean, the, the scale, I'm, I'm fascinated by the scalar difference because, you know, so, you know, urbanism, one thinks big and one thinks, you know, the macro and, you know, where are the walls and what fits in. So this idea of just, you know, picking an area and, and literally drilling down into it and finding the points that, can then illuminate more broadly is, uh, is, is very appealing to me. Questions? Yeah. 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 Thanks very much for that great lecture. Um, I'm very interested in the center, the new center. You mentioned um, the different regions that are involved, and can you say a little bit about the other? projects, field work? You mentioned East Africa, yeah. if I understood um, that correctly. We have we have, of course, sort of a core group mm -hmm. which got together already. I mean, when we did the application, which consists of uh, partly archaeologists, historians, and also natural scientists. And my vice director of the center, he heads the excavations in Riebe, which mm -hmm. is the urban site um, in, in, in Denmark. And then part of our core group is in York. Um, and uh, Stephanie Wynne Jones um, excavates on Zanzibar and um, has begun that within the last two years, and there are very, very promising um, results for, for one of these coastal, coastal sites, which is basically also of um, yeah, early Islamic, um, yeah, of pre-Islamic period. But when these trade stations uh, from the Islamic world expanded down to, to these sites. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, that's, that's what I, I can say. I mean, of course, I know some, uh, things about the work that they're doing. I mean, they're basically also excavating there on an annual scale. And as I also said in the introduction, it's not that we're only going to work with these sites. 
but the contextualizing part is such an important part of it. And if you're used to reading excavation reports, you also know that any excavation report would be different from the way you would do it or whatever. So it's about finding the right material to work with. And I think in the first place, what we are doing is trying to, to pose the possible question. So build up a laboratory of what we can do with the contextualized information that we know <laughs> is contextualized the way we would do. But you know we have to from the beginning also now. And that's why we are running a series of international conferences. And we're also recruiting internationally. So, anybody <laughs> does urban archaeology and, and we, we have a, a string of positions coming up um, of course need to look at what other people have done but always in the contextualized way mm -hmm. um, yeah so that's does that sort of answer sure. some yeah, of yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. the yeah. question bookmark herb net very interesting yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 Fascinating talk, and um, and I'm really interested in uh, how you're going and how you're taking these like really localized um, uh, contexts that you're dealing with. I mean, like the amulet uh, and stuff, and then br drawing that out to these uh, broader broader statements and things like the anomala cubitas, which is really gonna, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> which is a new word that's cool. there now. <laughs> yeah. Thank you for that. <laughs> Um, but I'd like to invite you to um, to expand on that a little more on how you take these sort of isolated individual um, and you're looking for patterns among these different things as well. So um, tell us more about yeah. that. Yeah, that. Um, I think it's probably, uh, well, or it is too early to look for patterns, but I think really what I wanted to show now with these sort of, you know, stray case studies from one side was really that whatever you find, you need to sort of try to get the story around it. And, and that's a lot of compilation of material because you need to, well, for the amulet, you need to survey the <laughs> everything that's done on these and sort of try to understand. Well, and we wouldn't have known, had, had we not applied this technique, we wouldn't have known um, that it was, you know, that it was an Arabic um, tablet. We would we would probably have thought that it was a Semitic um, tablet, you know, based on the context, based on perhaps the, you know, the closeness to the synagogue church and things like that. So, you know, our interpretation might have been uh, completely, not wrong, but very different from what we now came up with. So it's more sort of the, uh, what I term this high definition narrative history that you construct around a contextualized object that might feed into the grander narrative. And that could be, you know, that could be, uh, well, you know, the, the transition from the late Byzantine to the early Islamic period was very abrupt and then everything changed, which obviously now, I mean, an object like this shows, no, that was not really the case. I mean, I mean, that's not going to rewrite world history, but it's going to give a more nuanced view on what you can do even from one even from one object. So I think that's the sort of, you know, on the one hand, you have very large questions, and I think it's too early. <laughs> I mean, and we <laughs> hope that we will uh, survive 10 years, and we might be able to tell a different story then. But it's sort of making the grand narrative uh, speak with the high definition uh, narrative, or, or not, you know, or sort of. So it's almost modeling and modeling out. You know, well, out yes, and that's of course what our natural scientists are very much into, and they come with all these sheets. And if I can run 2,000 tests that costs whatever, blah, 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 this and this and this, I can make a model of. So it's sort of, you know, working with the big humanities questions and integrating it with the natural science. Because natural science, we can all imply, apply to everything. I mean, everybody can have C14 dating done, but the question is, I mean, where do you do it to do it right? So, I, you know, it's sort of that kind of method development that we are interested in. Would you also say that you're also looking in places that people don't normally look in? Well, I think well, just like working the in the Northwest side. Quarter, I mean, it was there the last 40 years when Jacques Senya was working in Jerash, but, and, and he had all sorts of hypotheses about the area, but, you know, he was more interested in, in, in doing anastylosis of the sanctuary of Zeus, but still having, you know, he did the most important, basically, and, 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 and it is still important, article on the urban development of Jerash, where he mapped out how the necropolis moved around in this area. 
you know, so, and that, that is something that is in my book, you know, because that was before I began to excavate there. Because you sort of need to believe that people know what they're doing, and he did know what he was doing. It was just not based on contextualized archaeological information. It was based on his view of what a Roman city was, or had to be. Peter, for last question. Um, I'd like to sort of follow what you were saying about sort of grand narrative or what you says here about sort of uh, social, environmental expansion, all these things with urban. You're, when then looking at the center of the map with the three, three major areas, having the Middle East in there, um, and when you sort of had you first been talking about child and urban revolution and then these things. I was initially sort of expecting, well, apart from the title of the talk, of course, but initially one would expect that your case study would be much earlier. Mm -hmm. So if urbanism is not usually sort of the urban case studies in the Middle East. They're not obviously sort of to do Roman periods of going much further. So there's big debates about the early Bronze Age, where yeah. that is actually yeah. a period of development. And whereas what usually is the case is obviously not normative, but still, could you? Well, uh, let's put it this way: we had to sort of set the border somewhere. <laughs> I mean, uh, I was, I was, we were I was earlier, yeah. telling Sue earlier. Well, it would have been really nice to do the first millennium, you know. Also, but um, I mean, even though we got a lot of money, we got funds that are limited. And I think we, we sort of, I mean, being a classical archaeologist and working with medieval archaeologists, we, we sort of have the core around also being able to test some of these these things against the, the historical sources. For example, I did work on collecting all the all the early medieval sources and Jerash and comparing it to our Mamluk fortress up there. And it turned out that the story was the other way around than this, the sources tell us. And that's um, that's of course one what can you say advantage of doing historical archaeology. So it's not that we would not like to work with prehistoric or, or earlier society, but we we simply don't claim to be able to do everything. And that doesn't doesn't mean that we're not going to let ourselves be informed in our conferences by earlier or later perspectives um, or whatever. But um, that is simply uh, one of the points where we needed to put down a border. So it. It was a discussion. Um, yeah. Ravina was saying that this is actually an instance where the medievalists are ahead of the Romanists. In some way. It's quite impossible. But I, I, su I suggest let's uh, thank our speaker very, very much. And I hear the little clink, clink, clink of uh, bottles and glasses out there. So a round of applause and then. Thank you.